I'm just looking. I haven't seen most of you since last year, so. <clears throat> Did you ever get up in the morning and look in the mirror and think to yourself, that can't be right? Somebody said, uh, we know that mirrors don't lie. I'm just glad they don't laugh. Somebody else said working in a mirror factory is something I could really see myself doing. Sorry. One more, we'll be done, okay? This one leads us into the lesson, all right? <clears throat> How do we look into the mirror of God's Word? Let's take time to reflect. The analogy of the mirror is used, of course, in James chapter 1 as he's urging them to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And he talks about the man who beholds himself in a glass. And after he beholds himself, he, he goes his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. He says, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deeds. We want to reflect on how we look in the mirror of God's word. This series of lessons has been called Open My Eyes. And we began with one called It's an Elephant. And we were talking about the fact that truth is an absolute thing. It's not a subjective thing. It's an objective thing. We talked about those blind people groping around and feeling different parts of an elephant and how they came to the conclusion that it was either a, a rope or a snake or a tree or a wall. And they were all wrong. Because an elephant is an elephant. No matter what their perception of it was, the truth about the matter was objective. It was absolute. We talked in our second lesson a couple of weeks ago about let us worship and bow down. Our world has trouble seeing the greatness of God and the reverence that we should have toward God. And we want the Lord to open our eyes so that we have a correct view of Him. And we naturally want to bow down and worship Him. Today, the, the title of this lesson is Look in the Mirror. We want the Lord to open our eyes and give us a correct view of ourselves to make sure that we see ourselves as God sees us. So look in the mirror. First, let me give a, a quick historical background in Leviticus, I'm sorry, in Luke 13, 1 through 9 that Joe read for us there. There is no doubt that this section, these nine verses, were written in condemnation of the Jewish nation. We don't know historically, Josephus does not record it for us, no one else does, what events, these two events that Jesus refers to, we don't know exactly what they were. The Galileans that Pilate had mingled their blood with the, the, their sacrifices, uh, and, and 18 people that had a tower fall on them and kill them. We really don't know much about those things. Other than what is mentioned here, it's very possible they were recent occurrences that were on the minds of the people. But whatever it was, these people had died. And Jesus took this opportunity to say to those Jews that he was speaking with, do you suppose these people were the worst sinners? And that's why they were killed in this way. And twice he says it, once for each of these events. I tell you, nay... But except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then he tells this parable of a fig tree that wouldn't bear fruit. According to the Old Testament law, when they planted a fruit tree, they were supposed to not take any of the fruit for three years. After the three-year period, then they could begin to look for fruit for themselves. So if I understand this parable right, this man would, have, would not have begun to look for fruit on this tree until it was already had been there four years. 
And three years he was unable to get fruit from it. So now we're talking uh, the seventh year he comes to this tree and there's no fruit on it. And he says, cut it down. And the vine dresser says, now wait a minute. Let's give it one more year. Let's fertilize it. Let's give it another chance. Of course, we know that the Jewish nation had rejected their proper service to Almighty God again and again and again. And we know that as a nation, the, the end of their time is coming soon. When Jesus said, I tell ye nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That stands first as a prophecy about the Jewish nation. If they had repented, all of them who did repent, who turned to the Lord, who accepted Him as Lord, would have had His warning. They would have been able to note when the Roman uh, armies surrounded Jerusalem. And they would have, because of the warning of Jesus and because they believed in Him, they would have fled under the mountains just like they were told to. And they would have escaped. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish, Jesus says. But you know, the Bible is not primarily a history book. I believe that all of its history is true and valid. I believe these are facts. But its stories have morals for us. Its historical narratives are designed to teach us lessons. Its heroes serve as examples. Its villains serve as warnings to us. We should never look at the Bible just for its history, just for its exciting stories. We should always understand that God is trying to shape us and mold us. We should understand that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It has a use for us. It is profitable not just as a story, but for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The Bible speaks to us. It challenges us. It changes us. It comforts and corrects us. And that's how we want to look at this passage here today as we talk about look in the mirror. Number one, a correct view of self will cause us to be easier on others, on our judgments of others. It's easy for us to look down on others. We know that Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1 may be the most misused verse in all of the Bible. We know that when Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged, it doesn't mean that we can't evaluate behavior. It doesn't mean that we can't uh, be fruit inspectors. It doesn't mean that we can't say this is wrong or you did wrong or you need to repent. We know it doesn't mean that, but it means something, folks. And it cautions us against hypocritical judgments. Read that passage carefully. They're beginning in Matthew 7 and verse 1. Because it's very easy for us to look down on others. It's easy to think of ourselves as better than others. Luke 18 and verse 9. Jesus spoke a parable there uh, about some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. It's easy for us to see the other man's sin. It's easier than seeing my own sin. Proverbs 16 and verse 2 says, All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. Proverbs 21 and verse 2, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. Proverbs 12 and verse 15, The fool, or the way of a fool, is right in his own eyes. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. It's easy for us to look at people who are suffering in various ways, who have had calamities, tragedies in their lives, and to think that somehow maybe they deserve that. 
Jesus explodes that idea here. Do you suppose that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans? No, he gives a clear answer. That is not why they died. No. Those 18 that, that had the tower fall on them, were they sinners above other men? No. That's not the way that we should look at it. Job's friends made this mistake, right? Job suffered all this terrible tragedy and calamity and his friends came to comfort him and actually harangued him and accused him and said, you have to be suffering because of your own sin. God wouldn't do this if you weren't such a sinful person to the point that Job finally said, you are miserable comforters. If you came to ease my mind, if you came to help me through this, you're doing just exactly the opposite is what Job says. Why? Because they assumed that calamity comes directly as a punishment from God. In John chapter 9, as they passed by, they beheld a man that was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see their natural assumption that his blindness was the result of someone's sin. And he was being punished for that, whether it was his sin or his parents' sin. Jesus, neither, neither this man nor his parents' sin but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night cometh when no man can work. Jesus is reminding them in this passage in Luke chapter 13, you are not better than others. You don't sit up here and look down in judgment on others. That's not the way that you should look at, especially others who are suffering. It is not wrong to condemn sin. It is not wrong to rebuke sinners. But it is wrong to be hypocritical in our judgments and it is wrong to assume sin on the part of others. So a correct view of self will cause us to be easier on others. And number two, a correct view of self will help us to see our own sin. Looking in the mirror shows us our own blemishes, our scars, our unattractiveness. That's when we look in the mirror and say, that can't be right. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, we, we find there two of the most comforting verses that you can find in Scripture. Verse 7 and verse 9 both tell us about a continual cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ that's available for us. Verse 7 says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and, and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all unrighteousness. Verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, if we acknowledge them, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do we understand the implication of those verses? What are we being cleansed from? We're still sinners. I know we're saints and, and we're not characterized as sinners. And so I, I hate to say that that way. We're sinners. Well, that doesn't characterize our lives. But we still sin. And right in the middle of these verses that are so comforting about the continual cleansing of Jesus, we have these clear, plain statements. In verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In verse 10, we have, we see, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We're not better than other people. We're cleansed. We're saved. But we are not better than other people. We have to be able to see our own sin. With all of the blessings, all of the advantages, all of the wonderful things that we have found that are only in Christ Jesus, we still struggle with sin. And Luke 13, verses 1 through 9, 
serves as a reminder for us of this. That we don't look down on others because we ourselves are also sinners. And then number three, a correct view of self will encourage us to repent, to turn from sin. Repentance is central to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter preached it in Acts chapter 2. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He preached it in Acts chapter 3. Paul preached it in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You've seen, I'm quite sure, cartoons making fun of the man standing on the street holding a sign that says repent or perish. But that is central to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Repent or perish. And it is for all of us. Repentance is God's tribute to man's free will. It reminds us when we're urged to repent, you have a choice. You don't have to continue sinning. You can turn away from those sins. So, repent. Repent is God's appeal to the goodness in man, calling him to better himself. Repent is the threshold where religion crosses from theology to a changed life. From theory to practice. Repent is the factor that brings faith to fruition. It's not just what goes on in here, but, but how it produces the fruits of repentance in our lives. Repent is the point at which faith blends with works. So let's talk about what does it mean to repent. I'm sure that you have seen this illustration of repentance as a pie before. But it doesn't hurt for us to be reminded of this. There are five elements that are associated with repentance. In a very technical sense, only one of them is actually the point of repentance, okay? But these are all so closely associated with it that it's fair to look at the idea of repentance with this. First, there is the element that we rethink sin. That we change our attitude, our understanding of sin. Turn your Bibles, please, over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And I pick this passage because Corinth was a terrible place and the church in Corinth had too much of Corinth inside of it, okay? The problem wasn't that the church was in Corinth. The problem was that Corinth was in the church. And they had all kinds of sin going on in their midst. And Paul wrote to them two letters before this one that we know of. We only have one of them, 1 Corinthians, and then we have this one. But in those prior letters, in at least one of them, he had made them sorry, he says in verse 8. Though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent or regret it. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Verse 9, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world work of death. For behold this self same thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge or vindication. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. In verse 8, if you think about it, he wrote to them and he explained to them that their behavior was sinful. He taught them in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that it was sinful for them to tolerate sin in their midst as a congregation. That they had to practice the discipline that God expects of a congregation. 
He wrote to them in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, reminding them that those things they used to be involved in, those worldly things, those sinful things, they could no longer continue in because those who did such things would not inherit the kingdom of God. He wrote to them about their mishandling of spiritual gifts, their mishandling of the Lord's Supper, uh, all of these things, he tried to, the false doctrine that was in their midst in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that there was no resurrection of the dead. And he tried to teach them better, and so they rethought these things. They came to understand more of what God wanted them to do and what he didn't want them to be doing. So there was a rethinking involved in that. Psalm 97 and verse 10 says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. We need, we need that kind of readjusting of our attitude towards sin. That we truly learn to hate evil. Psalm 119, 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. We need to see that sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. We need to see what sin cost our Lord on Calvary's tree. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 and 6. We need to understand that sin will condemn our souls to eternal hell. Spiritual death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We need to rethink sin. We need to stop viewing it as fun. We need to stop viewing it as a joke. We need to rethink sin in order to truly repent. And once we, once we rethink it, see it for what it is, then we will truly regret having been involved in it. Not justify it, not minimize it, not hold it as dear and special. This is a terrible thing that I have seen from time to time among God's people. When men, and it's generally men... This is just what I've observed, okay? When they sit around and talk about their sinful behavior before they were Christians and they talk about it in a fond way. They tell the stories of what they enjoyed doing back then and how they got it over on somebody. And Repentance means, involves that we regret our sin. That we are sorry over sin. That's what verse 10 says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. That we truly, honestly regret what we have done. And then there is the issue of resolve. That determination to do better. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of. We have turned from sin. We have resolved to do better. And that's the direction we're going. This is the actual point of repentance, technically speaking. This is that which takes place on the inside of us when we have rethought sin and regretted it and we determine we're going to turn and do that which is right. That's the point of repentance, technically speaking. All of these things are associated with it. But it is that Resolve that leads us to salvation. Repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. This appeals to the blessing that we have in us of self-determination and, and deciding our own fate and determining what we're going to do. This is something that takes place inside, or as old-time preachers used to say, takes place above the neck, okay? Uh, but then the fourth of these is that we reform. That that which takes place inside of us bears fruit outside of us. That we, as uh, John the baptizer said in Luke chapter 3, that we bring forth fruits, meet for repentance or worthy of repentance. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 11, he describes the various things that they did trying to clear themselves, trying to vindicate themselves, having zeal for that which is right, and on and on and on, as their repentance brought forth fruit. Patrick Morley, 
wrote about the misconception. This is in a book called I Surrender. He wrote about the misconception that we can somehow add Christ to our lives, but not subtract sin. The idea is of a change in belief without a change in behavior. Revival without reformation is impossible, folks. Because if the reformation doesn't come, we haven't been made truly alive. We haven't been revived. Religion that is not life-changing is weak, ineffectual, and it cannot save. What takes place on the inside has to bear fruit on the outside. That is reform. And then we have the idea of restoration. Restore to rebuild what we have destroyed, to give back that which we have taken, to heal that which we have hurt. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 8, Zacchaeus, don't want any smart comments about Zacchaeus and his sycamore tree and his height. And, uh, okay, but Zacchaeus was saved that day. There's people who don't believe that. They say, well, we don't know if Zacchaeus was a sinner or not. We know he was saved that day because Jesus said so. He said, this day is salvation come to this house for as much as this man also is a, is a son of Abraham. He was lost before and now he's saved. But look at what he says. He says, if I have taken anything from anybody fraudulently, remember he was a tax collector, I will restore him fourfold. That's what the Old Testament law required. Exodus 22, 1 through 4. To restore. There are some things we can't fix. There are some behaviors we can't take back. There are words that cannot be unsaid. But to the degree that we can, we need to restore that which we have broken. Al Johnson a number of years ago, robbed a bank in Kansas and was not caught. Years and years later, he was convicted, not of his crime. He was convicted of his sin. He wasn't caught. He confessed. It happened that the statute of limitations had run out on that bank robbery. He voluntarily repaid his share of the stolen money. Restoration is part of repentance also. Wabush is a town in a remote portion of Labrador, Canada. And I don't know how it is now, but <coughs> a number of years ago, it was an inaccessible town, basically. And then there was a road cut through the wilderness to this little bitty town of Wabush, Labrador, Canada. One road. You could travel on an unpaved dirt road for six to eight hours if the weather allowed it to get into this small town. It was the only road going in. And guess what? It was the only road going out. If you traveled that six to eight hours and you got into Wabush, Canada, the only way to get out was to turn around. Eventually, as we grow and learn the difference between right and wrong and, and decide to do those things that are wrong, we find ourselves in the city of sin. And the only way out is to turn around. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So this sermon, I think, this text is especially appropriate for a New Year's sermon. Here we have this tree. Six years old, seven years old, not bearing fruit. And the owner is saying, cut it down. It's a waste of space. And the vine dresser says, let it alone this year also. Please take a moment. 
to reflect on how patient God has been with you. You see, this parable is not simply an exhortation to repent. This is an exhortation to repent now. It's a reminder that the time is limited. Is there something in your life that you've been planning to change for the sake of our Lord? Is there some sin that you know you shouldn't be involved in that you have been planning to turn away from? Is there some good work that you have neglected? You're planning to do it someday, but you've neglected it. Have you been planning to become a true student of the Word, studying it regularly? Have you been planning to invite someone here to our services? Have you been planning to talk to some loved one about their soul, about the Lord? Have you been planning to be better in your attendance? Placing a priority on even Bible classes, and things like that. Have you been planning? Let me tell you something you don't know. The year of grace that was set forth there in Luke chapter 13, that this year also, one more year waiting for this tree to bear fruit, that is not beginning today. That began last year in January, January of 2021. That was the year of grace. That was the year where God was patient with you through that time, and now that time is up. You say, Rusty, you don't know that. I know that my statement about that is as true as anyone's belief that they've got this year to make those changes. We don't even know that we have tomorrow to make those changes. I want you to notice, if you will, that this parable is open-ended. There's no one in this room, there's no one in this world that knows whether that fig tree ever bore fruit. Now, if we apply it to the Jewish nation, we know they were destroyed in AD 70, that the temple was destroyed, and so we know that ending of it. But as far as just the parable itself, Jesus didn't tell us what happened to that fig tree. Did it turn itself around? Did it bear fruit? And I love the fact that he left this open-ended. Because if we're studying this with the right attitude, and we understand that this is about us, it gives us the opportunity to write the ending ourselves. This is your story. It doesn't have to be an unfruitful one. You can write the ending yourself to be exactly what God wants you to be. Let's start with non-Christians to understand that you were made by God, that you were loved by God in spite of your sin, in spite of your neglect of Him, that His Son died on your behalf, and that He is calling you to repent, to turn around your life and come back to Him. Today, if you will do that, based on your faith, if you will repent and confess your faith, you can be baptized into Jesus for the remission of your sins. If you will repent and come to Him. Let's talk about weak Christians. You don't have to stay that way. You're writing this story yourself. Let's talk about the unfruitfulness of our lives from time to time. It doesn't have to stay that way. We're writing the story. It's open-ended. We can determine how this is going to end up. And we can be fruitful for the Lord. And let's talk about faithful, strong, hard-working Christians. And remind you that this attitude of penitence... That this attitude of self-examination, this attitude of looking in the mirror and evaluating yourself according to God's Word should be an ongoing thing for every one of us. 
And I don't care how strong you are and I don't care how long you've been in the Lord's church. There is still growth that can happen for you. There are still things for us to work on. For you to work on. We're going to sing an invitation song. Why do you wait? Isn't that appropriate? Why do you wait? The end is coming. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. What are you waiting for? You think you have another year? If you have a need to respond, won't you come as we stand and sing? Sanctified throne. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? What do you hope, dear brother, to gain by a further delay? There's no one to save you but Jesus. There's no other way but his way. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Do you not feel, dear brother, his spirit now striving within. Oh, why not accept his salvation and throw off thy burden of sin? Why not, why not, why not come to him now? Why not, why not, why not come to him now? Why do you wait, dear brother? The harvest is passing away. Your Savior is longing to bless you. There's danger and death and delay. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not, why not, why not come to him now? Please be seated. <clears throat> Our closing song this morning will be number 841. I like this song just to put you in a good mood. 841, and then we'll have our closing prayer by Brother Matt Frampton. Again, encourage you to stick around if you can for our fellowship meal and devotional that will follow. Number 841, sing the first and last verse. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through. There's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in his promises grand. Sing and you'll be happy today. Press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way. He is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong. Look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by. There are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust Him each day, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and you'll be happy today, press along to the goal. 
Trust in him who leadeth the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, sing in behalf of Jesus.